Hi, I'm David Levine. Um, I'm here with Carl Zimmer, who's going to speak about his updated book, Planet of Viruses. Carl, you want to show the book? Okay. There we go. Okay. And Carl's the author of 14 books about science. Um, I had the pleasure of interviewing Carl about his last two books, Life's Edge, and Search for What It Means to Be Alive. That was on Zoom. And then in person, um, she has her mother's laugh, The Power, Perversions, and Potential of Heredity, which was named the best science book of 2018 by The Guardian. Um, he's an adjunct professor of biophysics and biochemistry and lecturer in English at Yale University. So kind of diverse uh, portfolio you got. Um, so I asked Alexa, how many people have died in the world from COVID-19 and it's- There are approximately 156,021 okay. deaths per day Sorry. across the globe. Okay, I can't say, can't say her name. Sorry. <laughs> so um, 232 million cases, 4.76 million deaths, majority in the US, India, and Brazil. The US, 43 million cases, 690,000 deaths. So it's 20,000 more deaths than it was like three days ago. So I want to ask you, because since you're, this is a book about viruses, you talk about a lot of the pandemics. There was one in 1918, um, 1957, 1968, 2009. And we can also talk about H1N1 and all kinds of things. So the 1918 pandemic, Spanish flu lasted four years. So people are asking me, how long is COVID going to last? I don't know. So what have you learned from studying all these past viruses and, and also about the transmissibility? Like you mentioned that SARS is not as, con as contagious, was not as contagious as COVID. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, I think, People who had paid close attention to the SARS um, outbreak in 2003, you know, we might have been um, maybe just sort of uh, lulled into thinking this might not be that bad. I mean, you know, SARS was bad if you um, if if you got uh, in, infected uh, with it, pretty high mortality rate, but it wasn't very transmissible. And then SARS-CoV-2, even though it's also a coronavirus, you know, had a fairly different biology, so that um, it is much more transmissible. Um, it's also, you know, much less uh, likely to kill you. Um, but unfortunately, um, so that's, you know, if if you have to take a choice between do you want SARS, or do you want COVID, take the COVID. But um, on a public health level. When you're talking about how many people are going to um, suffer and die, um, vastly more people are dying of COVID-19. I think it was um, uh, less than 800 people, I believe, died of SARS in total. And um, yes. and SARS, we eliminated. Like, you know, people who had SARS were, were um, isolated. Um, and that was it. We haven't, I mean, it's kind of weird. We have not seen the virus that causes SARS since then, except in like, you know, labs where they're keeping it very carefully under control. Um, we haven't had SARS since. Um, and yet, you know, I don't, I think COVID-19 will just be with us for the foreseeable future, like other coronaviruses. We have, we have several other human coronaviruses to, to deal with. Um, we can only hope that it will eventually, there'll be so much immunity to COVID-19 through vaccination or through recovering from infection that they'll just be much rarer uh, and, and uh, symptoms will generally be not as bad. So in 1968, there was the Hong Kong flu and 700,000 people died. Um, but again, I don't remember, it is a, it is a big story. I, don't, I, I should, I guess, but I mean, 1969, half a million people went to Woodstock. The Mets won the World Series. There was a moon landing. There's not a lot of talk of these, not, not a lot of division. And, um, you know, I think part of it, um, 
Mm. Uh, part, you know, part of it is that, you know, the flu, um, the flu is something we're familiar with, you know, just every year. I mean, you know, every year, hundreds of thousands of people worldwide die of the flu. So, um, you know, <clears throat> I suppose you could say familiarity breeds contempt. So that when there is a pandemic, um, it can be hard to, um, for that to really register. Um, you know, with COVID-19, we were dealing with a virus that um, was really profoundly uh, new. And, <clears throat> and uh, so um, we just didn't have a lot of tools for, for dealing with it. And, and, um, and so, um, so I think that's part of the explanation for that different response. Um, I do think it's striking that, you know, the 1918 flu pandemic uh, killed, you know, nobody has a good, a firm estimate of how many people died, but, you know, I've seen numbers between 50 million and 100 million. Um, and that's on a planet with a much smaller world population at the time. So just a incredible catastrophe. Um, and then these later, um, flu pandemics had much fewer uh, people dying. Um, now, how much of that was due to better, better medical care? How much of that was due to vaccination? How much of that was due to, you know, some forms of pre-existing immunity? You know, it may, it's hard to tell. I mean, there may have also been um, the fact that, um, you know, in 1918, we didn't have antibiotics. Now, antibiotics won't stop a virus, but you know the flu uh, sort of clears the way for bacterial infections, which can be really the the can for many people who die that's what kills them. So um, so antibiotics may have helped to 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 lower the number of dead. Um, so you know, but nevertheless, you know, virus experts are still really worried about future flu pandemics. So um, while we're dealing with totally new viruses like SARS-CoV-2, um, you know, good old flu uh, is something that we still have to uh, be concerned about. So when I got my booster shot, they said, do you want the flu shot also? And I said, I thought you had to wait two weeks in between. I said, no, the guidelines have changed. And then I read the CDC wants you to get them together. Yeah, yeah, um, there, there actually are. And there are now, um, some experimental trials where they're um, uh, they're actually like mixing the vex the, those two vaccines into one dose, you know. So rather than getting like a shot in this arm with COVID and a shot in this arm with the flu, just boop one shot. Um, and uh, you know there there are uh, you might actually be able in the future. You know, Moderna has talked about how you could get um, you'd have like mRNA molecules in your vaccine for COVID and mRNA vac uh, molecules in your vaccine for the flu, and maybe another mRNA vaccine, a mRNA molecule in that same little bubble that's in that vaccine for RSV, which is another respiratory disease. So um, we could be seeing, you know, increasingly these sort of, if the mRNA technology um, uh, lives up to its initial uh, promise, you could see more and more vaccines where you just sort of stacking them together um, as individual mRNA molecules in one bubble. Um, well, I think, um, you know, when I was reading your book about some of the differences from like H1N1, that was 2015, it didn't move from one person to, the not, to another. Um, and then other um, viruses do not have asymptomatic transmission like COVID does. So I think that accommodated, you know, accounts for some of the, some of the numbers we're seeing as well. I mean, Ebola is very deadly, but it's not transmissible unless you touch blood, and you know, you really have to be in touch with the person. Um, so a lot of people ask me, you know, because I go to museums, I play tennis, or say, aren't you scared? I said, you know, I'm vaccinated. Um, they have high ceilings. Does high ceiling, does that make a difference? I don't know, but. Uh, Paul Offit says he goes to museums. So I said, okay. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that um, well, you know, if you're in a well-ventilated space and you've got a mask on and uh, you, you have you're vaccinated and you're up to date with boosters, then 
yeah, I, I think that's I think that's okay. Um, you know, I I mean, if I was in a place where um, sort of the community transmission was really on fire, that might make me sort of you know ratchet up my own um, risk avoidance. But um, you know, I think unfortunately, like we just have to take all these things into account for the foreseeable future. Um, we all have to be um, we all have to you know learn more about. Um, you know, atmospheric engineering and epidemiology and, and all the rest of it. Like it's because this is going to be with us for some time. Um, the other thing that I was very struck by is that how climate change is going to bring more viruses to us. And you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, uh, there are a number of viruses that are um, delivered to us by animals uh, like mosquitoes. Um, so these are called vector-borne viruses. And so, you know, if you're a mosquito, um, you know, it, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to, to be flying around much when it's bitterly cold. Uh, and so if it's not bitterly cold as much of the year, you're going to have more opportunity to reproduce. And so, uh, you know, climate change is, is, is bringing um, certain species of mosquitoes north. So like I live in Connecticut, you know, we've been seeing tiger mosquitoes for a while now and they weren't here, but you know, in earlier decades and they bring their own set of uh, viruses with them. So um, you're going to see uh, uh, shifts in, in, um, in, in viruses due to climate change, especially the ones that are vector borne. Okay, um, so you know, looking, at, you know, you talk about a plan of viruses, and you mentioned that marine phages are the most abundant life form on Earth. Um, so it seems it seems viruses are, viruses are here to stay, and they're going to be attacking us all the time. But um, well, I mean, just just to clarify, I mean, yeah. it is true that like the ocean is just a giant bowl of viruses, um, you know, there, there are, the number is kind of hard to express the number of viruses in the ocean. Um, uh, you know, uh, some scientists have basically, they'll write a one and they'll write 31 zeros after that, um, which makes them the most abundant um, form of life period. But you mentioned you referred to them as marine phages, which is correct. And um, phages are specifically viruses that infect bacteria. So um, the vast majority of, of viruses in the ocean, um, they do not infect our cells. They do not infect animals at all. They don't, uh, they don't infect algae. They go for bacteria um, because there's so many bacteria in the ocean. Um, so, uh, when you're swimming around, like, it's not like these marine phages are going to make you sick. They're, they're not, um, um, but they, they're hugely important. Um, and they've been hugely important probably since the dawn of life. So yeah, when we say we're never going to, uh, get rid of viruses, part of the reason for that is that they've always been here. You know, as long as there's been life, there's probably been viruses. Okay. So you also talk about how the only disease we've successfully eradicated is smallpox? The only human, yeah, the only human human virus that we've really uh, successfully uh, eradicated, that's smallpox, which is amazing because smallpox killed so many people uh, when, uh, before it was eradicated. I mean, it was just staggering, um, you know, far more people than COVID-19. Uh, more people than influenza, just one of the worst killers in, in history. Um, but, and we got rid of it. Um, I, I, you can credit Elvis Presley was asked to take a, a polio vaccine. And there's a photo of him taking the polio vaccine because he said people weren't rushing to get it, but they, um, but I, I remember, you know, when, you know, getting in the sugar, sugar cube and, um, but there are, there, but there is polio in Russia and at the CDC. You, you mean smallpox, right? I'm sorry, smallpox. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Yeah, so so smallpox is not does not circulate um, in in the world now, um, but it um, 
but but uh, uh, you know scientists uh, held on to uh, some stocks um, at at the CDC has some Russia has some um, you know there there's been a lot of controversy over that um, you know because um, you know like there's there's you know suspicion of like well why why should these governments be holding on to these things um, you know. Do they want to hold on to it because it could be they could use it as a biological weapon, or are they wanting to like have defenses against it? So there's been a lot of debate about whether we should <clears throat> continue to hold on to these stocks or just eradicate it all, just destroy those last supplies. And um, you know, some researchers have made an argument based. Um, not on geopolitics, but on on public health. They they they've said no, we should because, you know, um, you know, uh, it could be that a, a very close relative of smallpox in some animal could spring out and create a smallpox like uh, uh, disaster, um, and um, so uh, uh, so that we should continue to be studying smallpox, that we should continue to be designing vaccines, for example. Um, this debate kind of bubbles along, um, goes quiet for a while and it flares up again. Um, but for now, we still have smallpox. It's just that no one's getting sick from it, thankfully. But um, as I note in the book, um, you know, some scientists, um, just to prove a point, they said, look, you know, we, we, we have the genomes of these, of these viruses. Um, their, their genetic sequence is not very long. These are they 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 have only a, you know relatively few genes uh, smallpox and some of these other viruses and so some scientists said like okay um, we're going to make a relative smallpox from scratch so this is something called horsepox and so they took that sequence and they just said okay we're going to we're going to physically make genetic molecules that correspond to the genome we're going to stitch them together. And we're going to put them in cells and see what happens. And they started making horsebox viruses. So their point was like, we're, we because we know the smallpox genome, we can never really eradicate it because the knowledge now equals the potential to make the virus. So you know, I, I it's this paradoxical situation where like I, I you know, thankfully none of us has to worry about getting smallpox. But uh, we can never be sure that smallpox will never come back. Right. Um, <clears throat> um, and also, I think that when um, the Soviet Union was collapsing, there was a, there was a fear of who who has who has that little smallpox, and there was a little concern that it could fall you know fall through the cracks or be stolen. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Um, the only smallpox, let me put this right, the only smallpox that we know of are, are in certain facilities, one at the CDC in the United States and another facility in, in Russia that we know of. Now, um, you know, it uh, turned out the National Institutes of Health had like some smallpox samples just lying around in an old storeroom that uh, from decades ago that people had just forgotten about. Um, and when they came across it, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, we need to like make sure that this does not spill and get out and so on. I mean, it's not clear if those were viable viruses. I mean, after so much time, but you know, the last thing you'd want would be to be the person who, you know, um, set smallpox loose again. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so, so is it possible that some smallpox samples were spirited out of the, uh, the Soviet Union as it was collapsing. It's it's hard to disprove a claim like that. I mean, but um, you know, certainly nobody has has you know we, we have not become aware of any of those smallpox stocks since the fall of the Soviet Union, and it's been you know been quite a while now, about thirty years. Okay, so. Um... Carl is happy to answer your questions, but please put them in the Q&A box and not put them in the chat box. Um, I'd appreciate it. Um, so I wanted to ask you, so I, I was um, 
flipping around TV and I came across the movie Outbreak. Um, with, I think it's one with Dustin Hoffman and he, he finds the host. And you talk about um, COVID-19, we haven't found patient zero yet. Um, but why don't you, can you tell the story of that chi the Chinese researcher? And what, what, cause that was a pretty, who, who passed away? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I want to make sure I pronounce his name correctly. Um, uh, let's see. Um, give me one second. Uh, Li Li Wen Li Wen Liang. Um, he was an ophthalmologist actually in China um, at a, a hospital in Wuhan, and um, you know he was uh, hearing. Uh, uh, you know, in in um, I guess it was uh, you know early. Er, um, yeah, December actually, December 2019, um, he was hearing about people being get, coming in sick to the hospital there. And um, he was getting very concerned about it, you know, asked some of his colleagues at the hospital and they were, you know, he was getting, hearing very worrying things like this might be a coronavirus and so on. And so he told his, um, he, he, went online to like an alumni sort of chat group and was was telling uh, people like, you know, you need to be careful, like there's something really bad going on. And the authorities found out about that. And, you know, he was taken to the police station. He, he basically, you know, had to sign a confession that he had been, you know, acting irresponsibly. He would never do this again. Um, you know, and he was one of the first people to sound the alarm when the government was still denying um, that there was something bad going on. Um, you know, pretty soon afterwards, the Chinese government actually did start to, to share information about, about the disease. Um, <clears throat> not long after that, unfortunately, um, you know, he was treating a, a patient, you know, doing an eye exam and later discovered that she had had COVID. He soon developed it and then he died. Um, so, <clears throat> um, you know, it's, it's a, yeah, we, we, he, you know, so Wen Ling Yang was not, um, you know, patient zero. Um, I don't think we'll, I, there's certainly a lot more that can be discovered about the very early stages of the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, if, 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 you know, medical records, hospital records in China are really, you know, opened up and, and made transparent for scientists to study, <clears throat> but I just don't see it possible that we'll find the, um, you know, the patient zero, because it's probably similar to what happened, say, with HIV. You know, HIV, um, scientists are pretty confident that um, what happened was that somewhere in a particular part of Cameroon in the early 1900s, there was, there were hunters who would, who would trap um, lots of different mammals and Somebody, somebody caught a chimpanzee, was killing a chimpanzee for meat um, and, um, you know, got exposed to chimpanzee blood and, you know, a, a chimpanzee virus infected this hunter. And then eventually <clears throat> that hunter spread it to someone else, probably through sexual contact. Um, we'll never know who that person was. And, you know, the, the, that, the HIV just sort of you know, puttered along for decades at a very low rate, probably, until eventually it got to a city. And then when it got to a city, boom, it took off. Kinshasa is the city, um, Leopoldville at the time. And then from there, eventually uh, got to other places. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so it's likely that, um, you know, certainly all the scientists that, that I talked to tend to, to look at this as a similar situation that some bat had this coronavirus, it got uh, into people, um, didn't have to be in Wuhan, um, it could have been very far from there, but then there was a, you know, somehow somebody with this or maybe uh, with the virus or maybe, um, you know, an intermediate animal host ended up in Wuhan and then, you know, had the right conditions with a lot of potential hosts around to to take off. So, um, so, but just because we can't find patient zero doesn't mean it's not important to learn more about how this outbreak started and also to understand 
what are the viruses that gave rise to this this particular virus because you know maybe they'll do it again so what made us so lucky to have a vaccine against covid when there's no vaccine against aids there's no vaccine against the common cold um, the, the, the flu vaccines are 50 50 percent effective maybe you know 60 depending on the year mm -hmm. But I still say you should get it because I got the flu, even though I had the vaccine, I had a very mild case. I, yep. I had no, no raging fevers, no aches. I was just tired and I just laid in my bed and watched TV for a couple of days. So, yeah. 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 No, that's an important thing to remember um, is that, um, you know, even if, even a, like a, a vaccine that has, say, a 50% effectiveness. Um, that may be referring specifically to infection. So, you know, the flu, flu vaccines, it can be 40, 60% uh, most years, but it can be, you know, lower than that, but that's against infection. So, um, you know, I hope everybody got their flu shot. Uh, and if you haven't, I hope you get it soon. Um, uh, it is going to substantially reduce your risk of getting the flu at all. But as you say, like if you do get the flu, it's also going to substantially reduce your risk of getting really sick, of going to the hospital, of dying. Um, you know, you, CDC has estimated, you know, that many, many thousands of lives have been saved every year um, because uh, because even if people did get the flu, they didn't get severe flu. Um, and that's something you know to think about now with with COVID vaccines, which is that. Um, uh, you know, right after you get the shot, um, it can have, you know, these mRNA vaccines have very high effectiveness, specifically against infection, as well as against severe disease. Uh, in the months that follow, it looks like there may be some waning um, in terms of infection, but, you know, uh, uh, it's still the effectiveness against hospitalization is, is staying pretty strong. Now, um, you know, eventually like a booster can be a good idea, especially for older people, because, you know, the, your initial response to that vaccine may not be very strong to begin with. Um, and, um, but, but in any case, that, that difference between infection uh, effectiveness and severe disease is an important one to remember. Why was it that we got a, co a COVID vaccine in like less than a year and we don't have one for HIV after, over 30 years, I guess now, people have been trying to do that. Um, I'd say part of it is um, political decision-making, you know, that um, there was a lot of political will to put billions of dollars behind uh, in support of vaccine development. Uh, and so we ended up with you know that that made it possible to carry carry out really large scale studies um, and to end up with vaccines in record time. Part of it also is that you know COVID, is, you know SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, <clears throat> you know certainly a lot of the scientists I talked to say like um, it's an easy it's an easy target. I mean they were telling me this back in like April uh, of of 2020. You know, when the, you still had like clinical trials and, you know, we were waiting to see if these things work. And people are like, yeah, honestly, this is, this, this is in the bag. This is going to work because COVID, this coronavirus is a pretty easy virus. You know, on the one hand, you can feel, well, you know, you can have a lot of mixed feelings about this. Like we still had a lot of people who have died, you know, and, and, you know, actually, a whole lot of the, a huge for, fraction of those people have died since those vaccines were authorized. Mm -hmm. um, that, so there's something really um, messed up. <laughs> and, you know, part of that is that, um, you know, it's vaccination is not just about making vaccines. Um, it's about having systems in place to get vaccines to everybody. And, um, you know, we, you know, we have a global situation where um, it's appalling. Um, just the the difference between uh, how many people are vaccinated in wealthy countries versus poor countries. 
Um, and um, we just we just haven't made the investment. You know, I mean, it could cost. Let's say let's say it costs fifty billion dollars to do that. Um, you know, we 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 spend fifty billion dollars on on lots of things in in this one country, and this is like what the whole, we could have done the whole world with with maybe fifty billion dollars. So, um, uh, so so it, but it could have been a lot worse. I mean, if we were dealing with an HIV type vaccine, we wouldn't have a vaccine ready yet. Um, you know, HIV. I mean. There was literally just a, a, a report out a few weeks ago on, on the latest HIV vaccine trial, and it failed. Um, so another failure of another vaccine against HIV, just to add to a very tall pile. Um, maybe mRNA vaccines will, will offer a new way to go after HIV. I don't know. But, um, but we're still a long way off from that, just because of the biology of HIV, just a much harder target. Well, um, I went to a conference all day on Huntington's disease, and I said, we know exactly where the gene is, but we can't solve it. So see, Alzheimer's disease, nothing really treats it very well. So there's a lot of diseases that we don't do a good job in treating. And I don't think it's for lack of trying, I just think it's there. It's complexity and uh, yeah. I, I mean, viruses are easier than I think than yeah. these sort of complex uh, problems like like Alzheimer's um, or or Huntington's. Um, you know, I mean, at least with a virus, there's 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 something that like if we can just keep that thing out of you, or keep that thing from replicating. If you can just train your immune system to go after it, you have you have some some reason to be optimistic that you can stop it or eradicate it in the case of smallpox. Um, but yeah, I think Alzheimer's, diabetes, these things will be a lot harder to crack. The other thing is that with um, COVID, I mean, if someone has it, you're a thousand feet away from them, you're not going to get it. So, but if if you inherit the gene, that's that's that, you know. Um, I still think one of, one of the things I'm amazed at is that um, people really have never gotten social distancing. I mean, I went to the U.S. Open and people were sitting next to you, and even though you had to, be, you had to show proof of one dose, I mean, that's the kind of for New York City you have to have, you have to be show your to go go eat indoors. You have to show that you've been vaccinated with one dose um, to go to a Broadway show. But I mean, I think that's good. I'd rather have something rather than nothing. But you know, I was at the New York Public Library in an exhibition and it was packed with people. The Metropolitan Opera started up last night, completely sold out. New York Philharmonic, completely sold out. I'm sure Hamilton would open, it's gonna be completely sold out. Well, I mean, uh, okay. I mean, yeah. but I mean, it's different than, um, you know, you know, it, it, it's it's September 2021. Like things are things are different, and um, you know, we we'll, we will see. Like, I mean, um, you know, if you have a group of, un, of of vaccinated people together, you know, the risk is very low. Um, uh, and you know, I will see what kind of you know if there are serious outbreaks that come about from these these kinds of things, and people may have to ratchet things back, but. Um, you know, I certainly like. I didn't. I don't think I appreciated that New York said you have to have at least one dose. I think um, that's kind of um, just just not good enough in the age of Delta, um, because when you look at the effectiveness uh, of, of vaccines, um, they work well against Delta if you've had two doses. Um, but if you have had one dose, it just doesn't seem to be enough to to stop Delta because Delta is just. Uh, it's just this crazy runaway train of a virus, you know, it just replicates so fast. So, you know, you have to have like, you know, really good, strong defenses to stop it. Um, and you get that with two doses of a Pfizer or Moderna. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, I would feel more comfortable in a, in a restaurant where everyone had gotten two doses rather than one. Okay. So can you talk about Echo Health Alliance, the controversial controversy over its grant to the Wuhan lab, the ethical debate over whether creation of the virus in the lab was protective or risky, and how this issue can be, you can read this too if you're having trouble, 
and how this issue can be communicated in a better way that doesn't lead to conspiracy theories? Um, yeah, well, I mean, um, I've done some reporting on this. Um, you know, the, the um, uh, so the EcoHealth Alliance has been doing for years, has been doing research uh, in China and elsewhere, looking at um, viruses that have the um, potential to spill over from animals um, and cause pandemics in humans. Um, so they've been studying what we're living through, but you know they were trying to understand it, you know, in advance. And um, so now there are a lot of questions about well, what was their uh, uh, interaction with with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which you know they, they collaborated with on, on a number of projects. Um, you know the the latest um, you know reports have been that some people got hold of a grant application to the Defense Department to to do some of this research uh, and that it involved you know sort of um, producing spikes from one species of coronavirus on, on another and so on in order to sort of uh, judge their spillover potential. Um, you know, like there, um, you know, as journal, you know, uh, as journalists, you know, we certainly have to re report on these things, but I think we have to also um, sort of uh, bear in mind, you know, what what these things actually do or do not imply, um, you know. So if you're looking at an application, you know you have to bear in mind this grant application was turned down. So what you're reading there, like there's no evidence that it actually even happened. So if people are trying to sort of uh, say, you know, connect the dots and claim that this virus was was a product of of, of experiments in a lab, um, you know, like this is not. This is this is this is not strong evidence. Now people, you know, can argue about what what's strong evidence or what isn't, but um, you also have to sort of like, you know, I think it's important to 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 be mindful of like what actually goes into um, research in labs and how you know how easy is it to do this research? How many people can do this research? Um, just because you have a sequence of a virus in, in your database, um, that doesn't mean that you ever actually had the virus itself in your lab. Um, you may have just had the genetic sequence on, in a database. Um, so it's a difficult story to report, certainly in part because you know, the Chinese government has clearly been not um, uh, been as, as open as, as the World Health Organization, Biden administration, and other uh, um, governments would like, um, you know, so we'll have to keep reporting the story. But, you know, I think also as a journalist who has been reporting on viruses for a long time, you know, I think that um, this should also not lead people to think that the only way that new viruses can possibly uh, emerge to cause us harm is through some sort of, um, you know, nefarious engineering or negligence. Um, you know, we, we do know <clears throat> that there have been lab leaks in the past, but these are all, these have actually been like viruses that we already knew about that were being studied uh, and that everybody knew that they were being studied. Um, uh, we've never had like a completely new virus like come out of nowhere through this, through these, these uh, processes that people are, are talking about. And we know with this viruses like HIV, we know that there is this repeated pattern of spillover that happens from mammals, from birds, from from these animal hosts into humans. Most of those end up as being dead ends, but sometimes there is there is adaptation and there's the ability for a new uh, virus that can cause, you know, wide scale suffering to to take hold, um, and and you know. You know, lab safety is definitely important, and and um, you know, con, you know, we should have you know clear controls on on potentially dangerous experiments. But you can be perfect with all that, and you'll still have new diseases emerging because of um, you know because of you know what you know what what you know 
you know, what are what are corporations doing to our forests? You know, like they're they're cutting them down. They they are uh, uh, they are disturbing these these uh, ecosystems. Palm tree uh, plantations are being set up in their stead. You're having you know massive agriculture on an industrial scale, which is a great you know breeding ground for new viruses as well. Um, those things still happen. Uh, and and we need to we those things we we actually really do need to address because it's not just coronaviruses that could spill over there are lots of other viruses that that are waiting in the wings. So the, before I get to the, a lot of questions on COVID, I'm going to this question about the bubonic plague. Mm -hmm. um, the bubonic plague was just such a gigantic problem for humanity, and now one hears debate about what microorganism it even was. How did that happen? I thought it was certain that it was a single bacterium that caused it. Yeah. So, um, so there are, you know, there are um, in the world of microbes. There's there's a lot of diversity, and um, and so you can have related species that can cause similar diseases, um, related species, related strains, and so on. Um, and um, then you know once. Once those things are history, it can be hard to figure out exactly um, what caused what. So, um, you know, Yersinia pestis is a, a species of bacteria, <clears throat> which is, um, I believe that's the one that's linked to the Black Death. Um, and, but it could be that there were other kinds of Yersinia that were involved in other um, historic periods of, of plague. Um, and you know what's what's interesting about plague is that this goes way back because uh, scientists have actually been um, excavating Bronze Age skeletons, human skeletons, and they are. It turns out that um, you can get DNA out of these skeletons and out of their teeth, out of their ear bones, and so on. And some of these have Yersinia DNA in them. So these people like had the plague in the Bronze Age scattered around from Siberia to Europe. Um, and it looks like you can even connect, connect them and start to start see potential like waves of plague in, back in the Bronze Age, which is, um, which is kind of scary in a way because like what it means is like you don't need airplanes to have an intercontinental um, pandemic. <laughs> you know, just people wandering around in the Bronze Age can, can spread it. Um, around from Europe to Siberia, potentially, um, but uh, yeah, I mean those are, those aren't viruses, so I don't talk about them in the planet of viruses, but they're they're really fascinating as well. So here's a question: Why do you think there's a vocal minority of healthcare workers who don't want to be vaccinated? Um, I, I you know I I think that um, if you look at um, reporting that other journalists have done or, or surveys. Um, I think you find some of the concerns that um, non-healthcare professionals have. Um, people feel like, um, you know, there, there's a concerns, you know, that these COVID vaccines are too new. Um, uh, and so, so people don't wanna take it. Um, or, you know, there, there was, you know, there, there was also this concern with flu vaccines. So, you know, when we had pandemic flu in 2009, you know, there were nurses who did not, were resisting taking that vaccine. You know, they had concerns about that vaccine. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, I think some of those um, people who are in healthcare settings, um, you know, <clears throat> I, I think if they if they have concerns, those concerns should be addressed. But on the other hand, um, if somebody is going to be unvaccinated, um, they are with something like COVID, especially the Delta variant. I mean, you know, you you are just deal, you know dealing with a potential vector. You're dealing with someone who's going to potentially be spreading it to their patients or to nursing home residents or so on. I mean that I mean the science is clear on that, and the science is clear that the vaccines work to reduce that risk. So um, you know so there are hospitals that are actually like you know telling people if you don't get vaccinated we're going to let you go. And I believe it was in North Carolina this week that um, some of those people are being let go. 
I mean, it's only a small fraction of 1% of people in these healthcare systems who are refusing to get vaccinated. Um, you know, it would be great if it was, it was zero, but it's not. Well, hand washing rates at hospitals are still, they struggle to get them above 50%. Yeah, I think there are campaigns and we know, everyone knows that hand washing is a good, good thing. Mm -hmm. They still talk about that. Right, and, and yeah, and, that, and that's, I, I remember um, some years ago, I wrote an article about um, people who were um, developing techniques to track uh, outbreaks of bacteria in hospitals. <clears throat> These are antibiotic resistant bacteria um, you know, really, you know, things you do not want to get spreading around because you don't really have many ways to stop them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and so they were using D sequencing DNA to basically like figure out, you know, which patient infected which, and, you know, if these patients are in beds, <laughs> how is the bacteria getting from one to the other? And, you know, sometimes it's hospital staff. And, um, you know, I was amazed, like there was a large hospital where, uh, you know, they actually like had people working full time as sort of like, you know, hand, sh hand washing police. And they would go up to people and be like, hey, like, did you wash your hands or did you just, did you, you know, did you pump from the hand sanitizer? Like, I'm not letting you pass unless you've done that. And we're talking about, you know, senior doctors who just, you know, couldn't be bothered. Like, and they were just, they had a lot of things to do. I mean, you're supposed to wash every time you know, that gets pretty old pretty fast. But, you know, it is... You're supposed to, you're supposed to clean your stethoscope, too. Right, right. Yeah, I, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so so that was surprising, I, I have to say. Um, and and uh, did, showed you how big of a problem these these kinds of, of hospital outbreaks can be. Now, one of the doctors, when I worked for the um, Health and Hospital Corporation, one of the head doctors said, we should have a we can we should have a hand sanitizer and that will open the room to the patient. And mm -hmm. someone said, I think he watches the Jetsons too much. <laughs> um, what do you think of a fourth booster shot now? We discussed that a little bit before we came yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. How many how many booster shots will a person be getting in a lifetime for COVID? Uh, so we don't know. Yeah. We don't know. We do not know. Um, you know, remember like um uh, it's not like this is like a pandemic flu and we're getting flu vaccines for it. This is a, this is a coronavirus and um, we haven't done vaccines for coronaviruses before. You know, the, we have, there are other coronaviruses that make us sick. They mostly like give you a cold, you know, sometimes they can give you some more serious respiratory disease, but like they're not that big of a deal. Uh, certainly haven't been as big, enough of, a, enough of a big deal to get, you know, a big movement to make coronavirus vaccines. Um, and that's not for one of scientists saying we should do this. So after SARS, <clears throat> a lot of science, you know, well, some scientists said, hey, how about a SARS vaccine? Like this thing could come back. And it was really hard for them to get support. Uh, and then, you know, there was MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Synd uh, Syndrome, which is caused by another coronavirus. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, again, they were like, hey, coronavirus vaccine. Maybe we should do this. And again, you know, there's a little bit of support, not much, you know, things didn't get very far. So, um, you know, we've got this coronavirus vaccine, like we have to, we have, we have to see how this, this turns out. And, you know, I, you know, it would be nice to give you a pat answer, but like, this is all new. Uh, and, you know, if you look at vaccines, um, you know, you have an incredible range, you know, you, you have a range of vaccines where like, um, you know, an initial series when you're a kid, psh, protected for life. Um, and then we were talking about the flu where, you know, the kind of vaccines we have right now, they only work for one season really. And, you know, work okay. So, um, you know, so, so we, we know that there is some you know, we've seen now that there is some waning of antibodies, some waning of effectiveness against infection with these mRNA vaccines. Um, inter interestingly, with Johnson & Johnson, it has a lower effectiveness, but it doesn't seem to wane over time. It seems more steady. Um, <clears throat> so, 
if you've gotten an mRNA vaccine uh, and you get that booster, um, you know, it's conceivable that booster actually um, is going to uh, be able to deliver a really strong, long lasting protection because your immune system response to COVID has had a chance to mature. Like you, the, your immune cells have gone off and they've divided and basically like gotten better and better at, at recognizing these, these proteins. And so that when you give that next shot, boom, you get a really good, strong, long lasting response. That's possible. I would like that. You know, I, I don't want to have to get another boot, a fourth booster, um, but we'll have to see. Well, MERS, MERS uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory System, um, killed um, 885 people. So that could be one of the reasons that there wasn't a rush to fund. Right. That, that was, I think, I think you're looking at for SARS. MERS was, I think MERS was less than 100 or something. Uh, I'd have to check. No, I, I looked it up, yeah. Oh, you did. Oh, so that is MERS. Oh, okay, that's more yeah. I thought. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, yeah. But we're talking. Yes, but exactly. That's a, that. <clears throat> um, you're exactly right that that those relatively low numbers really make it hard to justify a big vaccine program. Um, certainly, the way vaccines were being developed in the past. Um, ho hopefully, the, the experience with COVID nineteen. Hopefully, there will be lessons to take from that about how to make vaccines faster, how to make them, um, how, to, how to get rid of some of these roadblocks to going from designing a vaccine to uh, approval. Because there are plenty of other diseases that we need better vaccines for, like the flu. You also mentioned that some countries did it right, like you talk about South Korea, and there were very few deaths in South Korea, um, relatively. and. What did they do that was right? Well, um, you know, South Korea and the United States actually had the, their first cases of COVID-19 on the, literally the very same day mm -hmm. at the end of January. Um, and South Korea had had these experiences with, with MERS, with outbreaks in their hospitals. They had also dealt with SARS. So, um, and there was, so there, there was a, a, you know, they took these things really seriously. <clears throat> and um, so immediately there was a really good testing that was rolled out. Immediately there was lots of protective equipment that was being uh, uh, spread around. Um, and a lot, you know, really good investment in public health, basic things like contact tracing and so on. And so that saved a lot of lives. Um, it wasn't perfect. Um, unfortunately, um, in recent months, you know, South Korea is, you know, having surges of cases. Um, still, nothing compared to what the United States is contending with, but it's, you know, it's, it's not great. And part, of, you know, um, part of the problem is that Delta has arrived, and so measures that worked really well against earlier forms of the virus just aren't that great against, you know, they're, they may not be quite enough against Delta. And um, also, you know, they have, they've been pretty slow with vaccination. Um, and because, you know, they didn't have the resources to buy up huge uh, advance orders of vaccines like, like the uh, bigger, wealthier nations did. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so they need to be vac you know, they need to be vaccinating people as fast as they can, un un unfortunately, now, and they don't have a huge vaccine supply to do it with. Okay. So I'm going to have one more question. To what extent will we be able to prepare for future variants of the coronavirus by using computer simulations of potential mutations of the virus? Um, well, there's certainly a lot of scientists who are working really hard on that. And, and so, um, you know, they're looking at all the different mutations and they're trying to understand how those mutations, you know, affect those proteins, the spike proteins that the virus uses to get into uh, a host cell. Um, you know, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, it may be difficult to, to sort of uh, keep up with variants all the time. You know, we don't know how many variants there they're going to be or what their capacity is. But um, there are a lot of scientists who 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 are saying like um, 
let's let's come up with vaccinations and medications <clears throat> that aren't specific to one variant. Is there something universal to these coronaviruses, or maybe to a lot of coronaviruses that we can attack? You know, so there is work being done on what are sometimes called pan coronavirus vaccines. Um, those would be, I mean, you know, it would be great to see the same kind of, uh, you know, billions and billions of dollars of support that went into the research for our existing COVID-19 vaccines to put an equal amount of resources into pan coronavirus vaccines. Because then, you know, if COVID-25 comes along, uh, COVID-30 comes along, um, we might already be protected. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, that we don't have a pancreatitis vaccine, but there's no reason to think, to say in advance that that cannot exist. I, I think there's, I, you know, science, there are scientists who are trying to find it right now. Um, uh, they're not going to find it if they don't get support to do it. That's, we know that for sure. Okay. I just, hold, I just want to um, let our audience know about what's coming up. So next Tuesday, I'm speaking to Dr. Greg, and I, I can't pronounce the name, call him back um, at the Mayo Clinic, and we're going to talk about long haulers, um, which I always wanted to do. Um, then I'm speaking to Nancy Siegel, who's a twin expert, and she's going to talk about the New York City Adoption Agency that separated twins and triplets in the 1960s. And if you saw the movie Three Identical Strangers, that's what she's talking about. Um, on October 19th, I'm going to speak to a pediatrician from the Mayo Clinic about children and COVID, because they don't, there's no vaccines for them yet, for the young, young children. Um, on Tuesday, November 9th, I'm speaking with Dr. Paul Offit, who wrote a, who's, you see him every day on TV. He wrote a book, um, you Bet Your Life, From Blood Transfusions to Mass Vaccination, The Long and Risky History of Medical Innovation. And November 17th, we're speaking to Melinda Wenner Moyer, author of How to Raise Kids Who Aren't Assholes, the Science-Based Strategies for Better Parenting from Tots to Teens. And finally, November 30th, we're speaking to Lena Zeldovich, author of The Other Dark Matter, The Science and Business of Turning Waste into Wealth and Health. So we got a lot of things we'll be doing in October and November. I hope you'll I'll send out announcements. I hope everyone will sign up. So Carl, I'll show your book again, and where do people, where can people get it? Uh, so it's Planet of Viruses. Uh, the third edition is published by uh, University of Chicago Press. Uh, came out in April. <clears throat> uh, it's 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 a quick read. It's a, it's a small book. Uh, twelve essays about twelve viruses, and um, yeah, uh, you can go to my website carlzimmer.com. That's one place to find out about that and my other books. Or you know, if you just Google the name, you'll it'll pop up on Amazon and elsewhere. And are you working on a book now? Mm, you know, thinking about ones. You know, I, my uh, a, a book that I've been working on more recently, Life's Edge, um, came out in March, and um, so yeah, I'm still still trying to find the the right subject for for a new book. Okay, well, I want to thank you for spending time with us. Um, I think it's the fourth or fifth time. And I really do appreciate you sparing the time and um, everyone out there stay healthy and get your flu shots. Uh, when it's your turn, get your booster shots and um, we'll see you soon. Okay. Actually next week, we're gonna, I wanna talk about long haulers. So, okay, everyone take care. And Carl, thanks again. It's always great to see you. Good to see you, David. Take care. Take care, bye-bye.